Good evening. It's good to see all of you. Again, we have visitors tonight. We want you to know that we're honored by your presence. We appreciate you making that choice. There's there a lot of other things going on tonight, other places. But we're glad you chose to be here, and we hope your time will be profitably spent. And since our lessons always center on the scriptures, we believe that is profitable. All scripture is profitable. So we hope you'll search the scriptures with us. Periodically, we take a Sunday night to talk about a variety of subjects, not just one particular subject. And what it is, I guess, yes, you call it just uh, two or three or four short, short sermons <laughs> that may be on unrelated topics. We won't be using the PowerPoint tonight, but we do want to use tonight to do what we just suggested. Our first topic has to do with a model for capitalism, sometimes called the free enterprise system. I don't know that any economic system is perfect. I'm sure they all have their flaws. But I believe that the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments assume that kind of a system, not a communistic system or a socialistic system even. And I believe we see that in the verse woman of Proverbs chapter 31. One of those places, a free market or capitalistic system rewards virtue, and it also punishes vice. Unlike all other economic systems, capitalism doesn't thrive on greed. It can be present, but it channels greed, greed, uh, greed productively, I believe, in, into a fallen world. We're not saying greed, greed exists. It probably exists in all forms of economic systems, but it does allow and it encourages God-given qualities that are necessary for one's life. There's some good qualities learned from that system. This is not to say a Christian cannot be a Christian and practice Christianity in a communistic system. It may be exceedingly difficult. I believe it can be done. It was exceedingly difficult to practice Christianity under the Roman Empire. It could be done, but it was difficult. But when left to operate on its own without government interference, and that's always a possibility and a problem, the market becomes self-regulating and self-provision, uh, uh, kind of a self-provisioning mechanism. Proverbs 31 woman, we call it the virtuous woman, is a perfect example of how this plays out through a successful or a succession of, of a life, a, a liberty, and prosperity, and charity. We see all of those things and other good qualities that she develops. Proverbs 31 and verse 16 says, She can consider field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. So that tells me it wasn't a communistic system where you work according to your ability and you get paid according to your needs by the government, where the government takes your whatever you produce, your work, and so forth. And so the woman is able to do so only because of her God-given liberty and dominion that's established through a recognition of property rights. She had her own property. She could sell, she could buy a field. The Bible says she bought one. And so when we think about a free market system that's guided by the principles that each individual life has a unique value that's not to be wasted. And so we see a lot of good that came from her productivity that stayed there. She could own property, so it wasn't communism where the government, as we mentioned, uh, uh, takes what you make and gives back to you what they think you need. And so we see her doing this. And also its success is entirely dependent upon one's free as to how much and how hard you want to work. And, of course, the other system discourages hard work. If you're going to have to work according to your ability and then get paid according to your needs, that means the slacker over here, here he's getting the same pay I am, but I'm working a lot harder than he is. That discourages hard work. And I think we can all see that. But rather it's driven, driven by a loyalty to God and an ambition to improve one's life. We see that in several cases in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So 
there's a desire there. There's a willingness to work and enjoy the fruit of your labor. And so and Saul says we ought to do that. And so she couldn't do that under a strictly communistic system. In Proverbs 31, in verse 18, the woman toils and she makes a profit. Let's notice what it says there. She perceives that her merchandise is good, and her lamp does not go out by night. So she knows she makes a good quality product. The Bible tells us uh, some of the things she did. She, uh, well, beginning at verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion to maid servants. She considers a field and buys it. For her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes, she makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. And then it goes ahead to describe her clothing. So what those verses are tell telling us there, that she works and makes a profit, and that she sees that her trading is profitable, and so she works longer hours. Says her, her lamp doesn't go out by night. night. She may be up all, and it doesn't mean she works 24-7, but uh, a lot of times she's working late into the night to do these things. Each individual has the opportunity to put his or her ideas and dreams into practice under that kind of a system and to, and to seed or fail based on their own aspirations as to how hard they're willing to work or whether they want to slack off. But the free market system offers that kind of a potential for, of a profit as an incentive for pursuing your goals. We see her doing that. She had some goals, and she pursues those. And as a result, people will work harder. They'll work smarter. They'll figure out better ways to do things, and a lot of times they'll work longer. They'll do that. So they'll assume more risk and they'll do more hardship than probably any other type of economic system. There is no incentive to do that under communism or socialism. I'm not saying, again, that a Christian can't practice Christianity under some other economic system. You can't. It just may be harder. But I believe that the scriptures assume the free enterprise system that we, that we find. So consequently, prosperity is... is in turn, a blessing. Blessed all are those who fear the Lord and who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Psalm 128 and verses 1 and 2. Remember, remember what Paul said over in Ephesians 4 and 28? Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands that which is good, that he may, he may have whereof to give to him that needeth. So one of his incentives to work is to help people who need help and perhaps can't provide it on their own. He's not to, not to, he's not to gain from somebody else's labor and take that for, for his own, but rather let him work with his hand that which is good. It ought to be a, a lawful, a gainful occupation that uh, would not cause harm to anybody. So wealth is the, labor, uh, is the reward of labor. Not anything wrong with that. Making money is not a virtue, a vice. It's a virtue because the Bible says the love of money is the root of all. Root of all. Not money. And a person who doesn't steal, but rather he works, he makes money. But he uses it to help others. He may help the one who is in need. So as, as we look at this, in, in, in fact, success in one's work is evidence, I believe, of self-control and self-discipline. It takes self-discipline to get up and go to work early in the morning and to stay with it all day. And it suggests a well-ordered life. And a good work ethic means unceasingly improving 
on, on livelihood. Think about this. This is pictured in Proverbs 22 and verse 29. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. He's going to be recognized for his work ethic. What does that mean? Well, it means he doesn't arrive late for work all the time. He makes sure he's there in plenty of time. He doesn't slack off when the boss is not looking. Doesn't go hide off somewhere and take a nap. He's dependable. He wants to produce a good product too. His heart is on the, with the job and doing a good job. He's not just a, a hireling. He takes pride in his work and all of that. So, so we see that in this particular case. Notice that even in Proverbs chapter 31 verse 23 about the virtuous woman, the woman's family reaches a high position in their social life, which is spoken of as a good and godly thing. Her husband is known in the gate where he sits among the elders of the land. So he's known, and behind that was a good woman. And we see the, her, her qualities there. And then the logical order of the universe, I think we have to agree, is the work of God. And when we look at that uh, as part of his plan, our labor is for his glory. Remember, even the servant, even the slave over in Ephesians chapter 6, was to work a, a, a according to God, as if unto God and not unto men. So we do that because the Lord wants it. Colossians 3, 23. What you do, work at it with your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. In other words, we're to look on our work as an act of service to God. God says to look at it that way. That will help you endure a boss that maybe is hard to get along with. It'll help, it'll help you that. And so all, the idea is that work is good and it provides a theological basis of economics for economics and a standard of growth. So we see that in this passage. The biblical work ethic is based on a belief in the moral benefit of work, being able to help others. So we're not just short-sighted or, or narrow-minded where we're just looking at what's in it for me. me. But we're also thinking about what we can do for others, how we can help them. So as we notice this and look at it a little more closely, we see that it actually enhances one's character. You're building character when you learn to be dependable and a hard worker. And so it includes hard work. It includes uh, being frugal. I think we see that in the woman in Proverbs 31. It includes being reliable. It can be counted on. It includes diligence. It includes punctuality. It includes honesty and self-reliance. All of those things are things we work or learn on the job if we're dependable workers and, and we're it according to the scriptures. And so therefore, to a Christian, the, the status quo and mediocrity and all of that can, can be seen as idleness and also as indicative of an insufficient faith and a lack of commitment to God. We're to do this as, as we're doing it unto the Lord, it says. So when we look at that, uh, it's also a, a way to meet, meet one's economic responsibilities. We all have them of some kind. And so the Bible commands us to work. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat, we're told in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10. If any man will not work, let him not eat. So we need to be willing to do that. Not talk, talk to somebody who's unable to, but the person who wills not to, just doesn't want to do it and wants somebody else to take care of it. So again, with true liberty, there comes individual responsibility. And we recognize that more than we would in a communistic system or some other kind. Proverbs 10 and verse 4 says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. And that's easy to see. That's common sense. So returning, returning to Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman there, as a result of godly stewardship of property, pop, uh, property the Bible shows that uh, she produces an abundance of wealth. She has made servants. She had made servants. And that puts her in a position to help others. And notice when it says that, uh, uh, let me find the verse. 
Yeah, verse 18. She also rises while she's up at night and, and provides food for her household. Her household would include servants. Now, she may have used servants in preparing that. But she's seeing that it's taken care of. She's just not, not assuming that it's going to happen. She's taken care of it. And also that she helps the poor. Did you notice that? Notice what it says she did there. It says that she extends her hand, verse 20, to the poor. Yea, she reaches out her hands to the needy. And she's not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. So they're well dressed. Because of her diligence, because of her care and concern. And so taking care of those who are needy, that may include orphans, it may be widows, it may be any number of situations, maybe somebody that's severely crippled, not able to work. And she does this by her means, her working, and also by, under the Old Testament by her tithing. And through, through the avail, availability of jobs, we see here that new workers are given the opportunity to be productive and, and to provide for themselves and their families. And they can choose to risk their earnings and to compete for a larger share of, of the profits and all of that. And, and like her, you will rejoice in time to come. That's what it says about her. It says... Uh, Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, when he praises her, many daughters have done virtue, but thou excellest them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So we see what kind of a woman she was. She's a good example. A lot of times women say, boy, I can't measure up to all of that. We're not told this is a particular historical character that lived. We're just giving a description of what a virgin vir woman is. Somebody might say, well, she's superwoman. Obviously, she is a model of what a woman can be. And so we learned that about her. Well, there's a little lesson about uh, the subject of uh, capitalism. Another question, we want, another thing we want to talk about is patriotism and religion. Can they coexist? Well, sometimes people get heavy on the political side a lot of the times, more so, so that becomes more important to them than, than the religious side. Some people believe that Jonah's refusal to preach to the Ninevites was motivated by Hebrew nationalism. And in other words, as a Jew, he hated the people of Nineveh because he knew what the Assyrians were about to do to his people. And so he wanted to see them perish. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want to go there and preach to them. To them. Went the other, way, other direction. And so he refused to warn them of their danger. You can read about that in the first and uh, third chapters of the book of Jonah. I don't know exactly what his motivation was, but if, it, if that was the case, he's right to be ashamed and to repent of that. And if patriotism outweighs our love for lost souls, we need to take a second hard look. We need to repent. I've been doing some of my own rethinking about this subject uh, getting to political arguments and all of that. And uh, when politics deviates into a religious or moral question, I think so certainly we should speak up. I feel obligated to do that. And I've often felt the need to speak out when error is advocated and truth is misrepresented and things of that kind. But, but the politics itself, things that aren't related to th things from the Bible, I try to leave those alone. I don't want my political views to stand in the way of me converting somebody. That happens sometimes. People can be so zealous in politics that they make a barrier between them and a potential convert to Christ. Converting that person to Christ is the most important thing to me. 
I don't want political views to stand in the way of that. Everybody has some kind of view about politics, but, but the things that are just purely political and arguing about a lot of the things that are a waste of time. But when it comes to truth and God's word, then I believe we have an obligation to speak out about that. But having said that, I want to remind us of the marvelous privilege that we have of living in this country where we have a freedom to worship as God has directed. And with all of our problems and all the deviations from our roots, I think we can still see that this is a, a wonderful nation to live in. We rarely see people trying to, to go live in North Korea. We have people wanting to escape the United States to go over there and live. We have people over there wanting to escape to come over here and live. And so I think we've been wonderfully blessed. That's kind of recognized as we see the, the number of people coming from other countries. And so with all of our problems and all of that, it's still a wonderful place to live and work and worship. And we need to thank God for it. We ought to be grateful for every right and every privilege that we have. But one of the deviations of law and principles that we're experiencing today is that many restrictions are now being placed upon religion generally and the Bible specifically. We see that. In the last five decades, we've seen an anti-religion sentiment grow in this country and prosper. And to hear some speak or read from the pen of a lot of people, religion is the greatest enemy of our friends. That's what we're being told. Religion is the enemy. And we hear a lot about a separation of church and state. I believe in that principle. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe Jesus recognized that when he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And so applications that are made that uh, today that religion has to bow to modern thought. It has to give in. And some politicians have even said, we need to change our religious views so that their thoughts might work. Now, some of these restrictions have limited the teachings of biblical truth. When my parents were growing up and going to school, and many of your parents too, they had McGuffey's Reader. There were several different volumes of that. A lot of the math problems and a lot of the illustrations were illustrations out, out of the Bible or teaching some biblical principle like honesty and th things like that that build character. Unfortunately, we now see a lot written and a lot spoken from a growing minority of our population on the need of freedom from religion. Free from religion, and that's being advocated today. And so Christians today, we have to be ready and willing to speak God's truth and practice God's word, even when laws are making it harder to do that. And even as we see government becoming more hostile to religion and to Christianity in particular. And so there are certain things that God's word uh, mandates us teaches us that we must do. In Acts 5 and verse 29, we see an example of that coming up. Peter and John told the authorities at the time, we must obey God rather than men. And those situations are approaching us. Some practices must be stopped. And so some truths must be exposed and faced whether we receive persecution or not. We've got to accept that. But one way for us to be true to God and our nation is to be aware of words and of the words and the intents of those who founded our nation centuries ago. Their intent was for religion to have free course. And so we were given the First Amendment, freedom of religion, not to become a government mandate. Religion is not mandated by the government, but it's to be protected by the government. So there's some words we maybe... Uh, are aware of and need to familiarize ourselves with from the pens and the speeches of our forefathers. For example, Patrick Henry said this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the First Amendment, here's another quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was president of the United States in 1802. He said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and and state, but that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, 
but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. Well, we've seen that kind of go by the wayside in a lot of ways. And things are practiced that are not in harmony with Christianity. But that's what some of the founders said. And we have some other quotes here. Here's one from uh, uh, the House Judiciary Committee report, March the 27th, 1854. And it was a, a study that was brought about by a lawsuit to force the separation of church and state. It said, had the people during the revolution had any suspicion of an attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution have, would have been strangled in its cradle. At, at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and amendments, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged. Not any one sect in this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. That, that was religion of the founders of the Republic, and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. The great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was from the House Judiciary Committee report, March the 27th, 1854. Here's a quote from George Washington. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. It's hard to see morality being the way of life when you squelch religious principles. When a government has bound and gagged and handcuffed itself from teaching principles of morality, you can't post the Ten Commandments. You can't post thou shalt not kill in a school because that's part of the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying it would prevent the killing that's taking place and some of the schools being shot up, but it's, it's ironic and incongruous to think that you can't post that, thou shalt not kill. And yet we see all kinds of killing going on. So he said, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. So we see the school shootings, we see the church shootings that are taking place. We see the abuse of women, things of that kind. Those are all, are all we can't teach those principles in public places a lot of time. Here's another quote from James Madison, the chief architect of our Constitution. He said, what does it mean when the court declares something to be unconstitutional? It means that the founding fathers would have opposed this, would not have wanted this, as in the following. We have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We've staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. End of quote. So that was what he said. Another one by Benjamin Rush. This was in a deed for the use of the Bible as a school book. Back when they had McGuffey's was reading all that. Benjamin Rush was one of the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And he's called the father of public schools way back in 1791. If we were to remove the Bible from schools, I lament that we would be wasting so much time and money in punishing crimes and taking little pains to prevent them. Boy, boy. Imagine that. And, and then there's one from Fisher Ames. Fisher Ames was the author of the First Amendment to the Constitution. He said, we must make sure the Bible retains its proper place of preeminence in the classroom because when reverence for this book is not impressed early in a child's life, it never truly takes hold. Well, one time nobody saw a problem with that. So we're well aware that the term Christianity means different things to different people. <coughs> I understand that. It has a broad usage in our society, and even in the dictionary, it has a broad usage. Different things to different people. And that the views of some were in, were in a, skewed considerably. And we, we wouldn't call some of the things Christianity. But it's clear that our nation primarily was founded on principles that were in harmony with the Bible. We have to be willing to accept and teach and promote and defend and those principles when they are attacked as a Christian whatever I can do scripturally 
in harmony with the scriptures, then certainly I ought to be willing to do that. Under attack by humanists and others who resent it and who desire to overthrow any and all influence of God in our society, the Christian should never try to overthrow his government. And we have a certain loyalty. We're to be submissive our rulers and protective of them as well. If we wanted to survive, the only way we can do that is to be informed and also be determined not to be intimidated, not to be afraid to speak. When we become afraid, afraid to speak, then we've, we've lost the battle. We need to be willing to speak. Not promoted by violence. We can't do that. We can't promote Christianity by violence. And we don't want to make any, any just religion a state church. We're not in favor of that. I think that's what they meant by separation. Uh, in England, you had a state church, the Church of England. But uh, they were fleeing from that. And we're not in favor of that either. So we accept that principle. And we don't want to force one religion on anybody. I don't want to force anybody to become a member of the Church of Christ. I, I would like to persuade them. I would like to study the Bible, Bible and let them from their own free will make up their mind to become a Christian. But it wouldn't do any good if I tried to force them. They would just be a Christian in name only because it wouldn't come from the heart. And so Romans 13 is important and we need to submit to our authorities. We must not allow these privilege as best we can to be lost or to diminish. Well, one other thing we want to talk about, and this one will be a little brief, more so, and that's about parenthood. No doubt Mary and Joseph were good parents. God selected them for a reason. But even good parents say things that they shouldn't say. We slip up at times. Can you imagine how easy it would have been for them to say to James, James, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? What would that do? <laughs> well, as we know, for some reason, Jesus' brothers were not his biggest fans. There was one occasion when they said he's beside him. And they didn't always agree with what he was doing. You remember that in John chapter 7. Could it have been the fact that they were living with a perfect sibling? Imagine if you had a brother or sister that was perfect, and, and there's no way in the world you can measure up to that. And that's the standard that has been set. And you're growing up with this person, or your brother or your sister. Well, sibling rivalry is nothing that parents should encourage or spur. We saw that happen in the case of Isaac and Rebekah with Jacob and Esau. Each one of them had a favorite, didn't they? We saw what kind of problems that caused, even later on in their descendants. We saw that in the case of Jacob. He didn't learn a lesson from that. And his treatment of Joseph in comparison to the other brothers, making him a coat of many colors, but doesn't say he made those for any of the other brothers, just for Joseph. And so there was some favoritism being showed there. So especially when it leads to a child disrespecting themselves or doubting their parents' love. We don't know what all was going on in the minds of the brothers of Joseph, but some of that may have been going on. But the truth is, none of us are like our big brother Jesus. None of us are like him. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us quite a bit about him. Thankfully... We don't have to be. The Lord hasn't required perfection of us. If he does, it's too late for all of us. <laughs> we haven't been perfect. But we can be forgiven. And when we are forgiven, then the Lord counts that. Like that because we've been forgiven. of. He didn't hold us against us anymore. So he did that part for us. He offered himself so our sins could be forgiven. And so we, so we stopped trying to rival Jesus in the way of any kind of uh, self-righteousness or anything like that and stop thinking that God can't forgive you or love you even as he does his unique son, his only begotten son. He loved each one of us enough to offer that only begotten son for each one of us. And he can do that because he's the perfect parent. 
And that doesn't mean we don't need to make some necessary changes. We've got a sign out front that says, come, come as you are, but don't leave as you were. Don't leave as you were. We all ought to want to leave better. We ought to want to be better people when we leave as a result of coming together, worshiping, and being taught and admonished and edified by each other when we come together and more devoted to the Lord. Well, those are our three topics for tonight. I hope that some of them at least were beneficial to you. It may be that you're not a Christian tonight, but surely you see that Christianity offers the best hope we have for a future life. We've been studying world religion. Scott's been teaching that back here in one of the adult classes. And I, and I notice the uniqueness about Christianity more and more. It shines brighter as we see the founding of other religions and the shortcomings of other religions. And a lot of them, there's a, a vagueness to them. Not anything, uh, it, it's kind of hard to, hard to sink teeth into some of it. But we have a clear message here in the Word of God that tells us the way to live, a road map from earth to heaven. And it offers us hope for the future by the one who died to save us and he was resurrected and he promises us to be able to do the same thing. I don't know any other religion that promises that. And so I'm willing to go with Christianity for that, for that just, that one would die for me, would show that kind of love with nothing to gain for himself and even his early apostles. They had no gain in this world. What they did did not benefit them. They did not gain financial wealth from it. From it. They were often persecuted. They didn't gain popularity. They gained notor notoriety in a lot of cases. And especially Paul, uh, he had a reputation and people, people were getting him. But truly the best hope we, we have is found in the Word of God. In the New Testament we find people who hear the gospel and they see the good news and they see the hope that it offers and they see the re reason of accepting the eyewitness testimony of those who saw Jesus after his resurrection. And then they see the sensibleness of it. And they see that the way of life that Christianity offers is the best way. It's the safest way. And even in life, living your life by Christian principles is the best way. Tonight, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ... You need, you need to admit your will to the Lord's. That's where we need to begin. That requires humility. Humility is really the first step in the plan of salvation. I know we say, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But it begins with humility. You're probably not, not going to have a second step if you haven't humbled yourself and recognized your need for something that you can't do for yourself, and that's save yourself. You can't do that. Even when we, when we make conditions that the Lord has given us of repenting and, and confessing and being baptized, even when we meet those conditions, we haven't earned it. We haven't merited it. We're simply meeting the conditions that he stated. That's not anything we invented. The Lord told us what he wants us to do. And when we do it his way, we can be assured that he's thought it through. He knows what he's doing. We've got to have that kind of trust in him that he knows what he's doing, whether we understand all the ramifications of it or not. not. If you haven't repented and been baptized into Christ, tonight's a wonderful opportunity for you to do that. We hope you will as we sing the hymn that's been selected for your encouragement. <laughs>